before our mingled breath exhausts the candles, an undiscovered island of Whitney Houston's, their irrepressible refrain piercing the white caps and sea spray, their luminous eyes smizing from the distant shore, features merging as the swipe speed increases and blurs each face back into the one the bakery has airbrushed next to mine across this moist and delectable confection we now jab at each other's pouting mouths, fork by fork. My father, Bacchus, wanted a daughter instead of me. He felt the threat a son implies and took you, my infant virility, scarf skin like a halo, angel of my innocence, four-fledged. Before there was you, there was guilt. You were vestigial as the divot where the angel pinched my lips in binding silence. Would I see myself in style or fit if I encountered you, my soul, draped on a fence post? You must be tattered like a moth-eaten turtleneck by now, hood like the hood of a headsman. If you were re-appended, would you lisp like chiffon or crunch like corduroy? You are the macho my father's dream foretold. He who in the end was like a son to me whose own member circumscribed a foreshortened life story mine was intended to resemble. My forebear, the brutal gardener. He who conjured the corona must have foreseen his own eclipse and standing on ceremony, found at hand a means to get my sex to bleed. Let me one more from here. The swear jar isn't empty. Full of flowers instead of coins, it curses a bouquet of hate-me-nots. A tangled vine of credit extended to one most likely to default. Such a trifling bargain, flowers for mercy. Oh, nature, predatory lender. Risk is the commuter bus I'd ride between damnation and wonder. Arrival and departure, both leading in the same direction. Give me chastity, O oh Lord, says the Berber saint. But stitch my wounds loosely, for miracle and sin are kindred. Each is hatched from a broken law. Now read uh, one more here uh, called Metaphor. <clears throat> Metaphor. It means to transfer or carry, as a man might carry his namesake in his arms or on his shoulders, cheering, we bad, uh-huh, we bad, as my father did when he saw himself in me. As I came of age, however, I thought my father was, in the sense that means to hamper or impede, an embarrassment, which is, as all language is essentially, a metaphor. I.A. Richards says a metaphor consists of a tenor and a vehicle. My father would point out that he's using a metaphor to define metaphors a literalization, like the relic to the corpse. Like when Richards asks himself if a wooden leg is a metaphor for a wooden leg. My dad, Gregory Pardlow Sr., before he died, lost his leg to diabetes. Even though he would be the only person to see it, he insisted that the prosthesis precisely match his skin tone. This is the same guy who gave me a Hot Wheels car for Christmas. A joke, see. He promised me a car when I turned 16. It shimmers on my desk now. A kitschy muse with shark's teeth decals behind the wheel wells. Before he died, 
I told him I would have preferred a matchbox car packaged in an actual matchbox, literalizing the figurative commingling of tenor and vehicle, more metonym than metaphor, a pedigree in other words. He told me to get the stick out of my ass. Greg Pardlow is dead. Long live Greg Pardlow. Thank you, thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Kwame. Kwame, you're muted. Thanks. That's great, Greg. So this is a new work that you've, you've been messing with, I take it. Yeah. Yeah, this is all bouncing around in the, in the new project. Um, particularly one of those I've, I've published even. Um, I'll read a stretch that may be a little longish, but it would just be that. Um, this is this is fairly new work. I don't think it's seen any light of day. Um, I'm in a conversation with the poet John Kinsella from Australia, um, and it, it manifests itself in poems that we're, we're writing, but of course we are sort of doing our own thing as well. So we've been working on a series, we just finished a series what, that we call Coda to History. Mm. And so we are now embarked on something called Footnotes. Mm. Um, you can see slowly, we had a, sec, a, a, a sequence that we called History, then we did Coda to History because we weren't done. And now we're doing Footnotes, which means that we're still, and at first we were calling it Footnotes to History, but I thought that's just getting carried away and silly. So we just call it Footnotes. But this is not from that. So this is just a poem from, it's from Coda to History. It's, it's titled The Foreignness of Our Mouths, which is a quote from Martin Schifero, um, Ethiopian Eritrean poet. One, a deep grotto, the mist softly rising, the dense mountains above the world on mute, a silence, the path is empty, it trails between banana trees, mango trees, and one coconut tree, where one expects a goat, maybe a chicken. There's nothing, the silence is deep, the seeing moves along the path, an open field, the side of a mountain, a fence, then green and more riotous green. If you cut away, then return closer to a bush, then cut away and return to the blank sky and cut away and return to the sun glaring and then cut away to the sudden brash loudness of crickets at dusk. The country is as noisy as warfare. That is merely the sound raised, birds, the sharp cacophony of living, cut away to silence. The ordinary yard, the path, the puddle of water and sudden unrelenting dark. I have imagined this opening moment of a film, perhaps the sound of water, that too, not a river, but a standpipe leaking, and then nothing else, like a place with no name, except it is Jamaica and it is Kingston, and nothing will happen, nothing alarming, and yet everything happens here. This is how I have imagined an unfinished novel. Two, so much time lost for the novelist to say, I'm a mommy's boy, and I'm a walking Oedipus cliche who will kill his father and sip lemon leaf tea with crumbs of sweet Madeleine. How much time must pass to then say it is the mother thing. Words, words, words in the boulevard said in the French way. Three, the soul's delicate charm of the watercolor, or to live in such bearable likeness of truth, the filigree of sprites, of a sprite's body, not always, but in the way of a, cha, a, 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 a chi hello, haloing the earthy efforts of the flesh, or perhaps we mean the dream, the way of dreams, even those thick as the sudden fall of night. Somehow, somewhere, perhaps, on the outline of the mountain, there is the dance of the ferns, their giggle and whisper, the thing that makes us breathe, 
the indulgence of hawthorns, the profusion of words and more words, the soul wounded seeking in the open field of spinning flowers and their toil, something holy, something unreachable. It is midsummer and the air is heavy with heat and I sweat without grace. I sweat with a man's funk and constant stench of decay on me. Four, I continue these daily walks and the body is finding its own kind of stasis, the kind that one associates with peace. I test my grief by the prospect of tomorrow. And while the thing I see before me is not a canvas thick with gloves of muddy oils, damp, slippery and crowded and without light, something subaquatic, the deepest dark I have never seen, I remain the beneficiary of chemistry, the peculiar conversation that continues in my blood, how sunlight, how my dark skin, how my organs, how the chemicals I know consume each day with barely an understanding of what they mean to my vessels and my heart. This is the faith of the believer. The priest says, this is good. And the second opinions arrive from the monastery and I accept them. Though a Nigerian woman has been saying that she feeds her children the ancient herbs of her village and she knows that they will stand before every affront of this modern world as aliens or sojourners and will live. Some of us face death this way, some of us face the news of death this way, and we commiserate at the news of Sue the singer who would spry the stage of the church of white singers and bring soul as old as mud to bear on the praises of people. Sue who carried her body and the disappointment of love, the patience and anger of love. Sue the one who weighed forgiveness against anger and then said, I forgive for the alternate, for the alternative would be another death. Sue who when the virus stalked her face, beatified by the hollow of the chemo's rage, zoomed into her heart with her last songs, into our hearts with her last songs. You see it in the eyes, I said to myself, and no one else. And then the news, and the march of incantations and denials, the way death makes us inventive so we can continue on this peculiar lottery with meaning. Still the light, the light, how it persists across the prairie land, how it arrives as a defiant hope, how it enlivens the blood, how it turns the skyline into that prostium, delicate watercolor charm. Yes. Oof, wow, great God. Thank you. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you, Gregory. This, is, this has been wonderful. Now we're going to take questions. Uh, I've been getting all kinds of questions on my personal gadgets and and on the chat too now we will take some some questions um we had people join us from the u.s from the uk from ghana nigeria kenya from from everywhere it's 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 been a joy really okay this is a question here um all right this is a question from kechi greg ripato spoke about the extent to which public or communal self consciousness is internalized and how this could become a burden for the writer and Kwame does talked about the way the writer thinks of their own individuality and the community as both proportion for the work and burden I want to ask what does the young writer wrestling with this tension do how do you navigate this self internalized uh, self-consciousness has to do with the individual and the community. Uh, Greg, and then we'll come to Kwame. Yeah, I don't think that's a challenge for the young writer alone. That's uh, the, you know, the um, novice writer. It's a challenge um, that does not, one does not overcome. Um, and this is, Kwame, you were, you were speaking of this, uh, this balance between the, the, the tyranny of the individuality and the tyranny of, of community. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always sort of wrestling with that. I won't even call it a balance, uh, but I think that's what I want to do is, is incorporate that the tension into the work uh, rather than see it as something to resolve. It is something that, that troubles the, you know, the, the poem is built on many levels of, of subtext and, and, and you know, 
articulated and unarticulated discourses, an archive of discourses, right? And so I, I'm, um, for example, in the in the Tituba poem, um, you may have heard what I what I what I hope in, in any case um, when it's on the page, some would recognize Lucille Clifton. Uh, what what did I think to become non-white and woman? Right, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm making these. It's funny, funny. You mentioned translation. Wherever I can, I, I want to bring in the um, sort of illusions and, and um, shared cultural knowledge that that exists beyond the poem. Um, incorporate that into the, the the poem in a way that just adds to the, the complexity of the poem. It adds to the potential readings and the, 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 the volume of meaning, um, while nonetheless sort of speaking to my own idiosyncrasies and, and, and very personal uh, obsessions and, and, and curiosities. Yeah, I think, I think so, and you know, it's an interesting. It's an interesting question. I like the way that Kechi sort of positions it as what does the younger writer sort of do. I think Greg is right that we all wrestle with it. But I think, I, I think what I say to a younger writer is anything that is preventing you from writing is a problem. In other words, resist. The goal is for you to keep generating work because your writing teaches you how to deal with these things. If you spend it at too much time thinking about it and not writing, then this is obviously not the best arrangement, right? This is as, as profound as these discussions might be, they're not helpful. Uh, because the truth is, what we want is that writers write. But, but I can say though that I think what Greg has sort of articulated in, in, in one way is the idea that the, 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 the lack of sort of removing the pressure to resolve. Is, is a liberation that can then generate sort of you know generate work because I think you don't have to resolve this but I think you can see opportunity in, in these things in what I call tyrannies but you can see opportunities in both things I, I, I've been really trying to think hard about myself as a writer who was just starting out in my eight, you know late teens I was 18 19 20 and I realized that I was more driven not by a desire for personal articulation, that is to, to sort of express myself, but by being envious of a tradition and wanting to be a part of it. In other words, wanting to have a say in that tradition. So, so it, it came out of sort of reading all of these writers and thinking, how can I be a part of that, that, that you know, how can I be a part of that, that, that army? How can I be a part of that, long history of engagement, that long history of beauty, that long history of, of creating. And, and that's, that's the archival impulse, but it drove me, it made me sort of sit down and think, who do I, what, what do I want, what can I say into this space and how can I be part of that space? And part of that conversation re required me valuing the tradition and knowing it. Um, so, so that's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer comes from an articulation of faith, and it's faith in the sort of generic sense of faith, which is the, 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 the persistent belief that our personal self, what, what, what the constructionists would used to call our discourse, that is our core discourse, is, is as persistent and as dogged and as, as, as as annoyingly present and hard to shake as our capacity to do things we don't want to do but end up doing. Mm -hmm. By that I mean, we do not, I think we spent so much time working hard to speak my voice mm -hmm. when in fact, if you think you're imitating somebody, you're failing because we can tell it's not, you're not doing a good job. In other words, trust that your voice will take care of itself. So that's the act of faith. So you don't have to work for that. It will take care of itself. You will soon tire of 
of, of, of recognizing the failure. Do you know how many poets I try to imitate? And every time I looked at it, I thought, oh my God, that's not close. I could tell, right? And then I had, it clicked in me that maybe, the, maybe what is my voice is the space between that and this. Maybe that's what my voice is. But the effort to imitate was necessary. It trained me and so on and so forth. But, but, there was, but Walcott was in no danger of my successfully imitating him. Right? so that people would mistake us. He was in no danger, right? And, 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 and Lorna Goodison was in no danger. And Tasaki Shah, they were in absolute no danger. And so my, my sort of anxiety that I don't want to be like anybody else is cute, but it's stupid. So it's just, just let it go and, 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 sort of, and sort of trust that as you train yourself, understand the tradition and so on and so forth, but your, your self will be persistently there. Just don't fight it too much. That, that, that's what I would say to, 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 to a young writer. But I think the young writers, I want to see more writers sort of commit to understanding what exists of the tradition mm -hmm. and, and, and ju just try and see what it is for what it is and see how they can walk into that river themselves as well. To me, that's that's the that's that's what I would that's how I would advise. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Kwame. Uh, there's a question here. It said, "Black bodies have especially experienced the world in a specific way, inscribed upon, mutilated, designated as inferior, enslaved." I imagine that the body itself is an intimate. Oh. I wonder what the role of the body is in both Kwame and Greg's work. Hmm. And, and I'm thinking of, say, Before Winter by, uh, by Kwame, for instance, or even Marginalia by Greg, right? Notes the confection, uh, the confectionery of the body and, you know. I'll say something relatively, you know, provocative and, and you know, but that's fine. Um, I don't think I don't think we have a purchase on sort of mutilated bodies as black bodies, right? So, so I like to be very specific about where where that fits into the narrative. The, the Atlantic Atlantic slave trade and the colonial enterprise globally created uh, globally amongst black people created a specific series of 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 assaults on the black body that are not theoretical they are they are real and they're practical and in that sense i would say yes let's understand how that operates and how that has been translated into contemporary society and so on but my access to the idea of the body as a as a as a as a, as a part of the the, the, the sort of the, the, the palette of poetic articulation extends beyond even that narrative so so what i do is i translate other narratives of, of, of what has been bodily manifested by other writers in other traditions and other experiences, whether it's Bible and the Judaic tradition, um, whether, whether it is the entire, um, the entire sort of early English tradition of the ways in which we think of Beowulf and so on and so forth. And to then say, how do I see writers, artists, all contending with this, I think, relatively broader understood relationship between the individual and the poetic expression of what that individual is doing and therefore how does that translate into the ways in which we do that in the context of the real and and lived history of this this uh, this assault this rightly identified assault on the body um and, and i think in that sense um you you're not saying anything profound to say that um a willingness to be aware of the body despite the trauma of that willingness, can generate powerful and, and meaningful work, right? Um, I think, I think that, that's, that's going to be true across the board. It's just that we all contend with different ways in which that history has impacted our bodies in the present, in the distance, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, 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 but I'm, I caution because I know how these things go. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little joke, which again may be a problem, but I remember at one point when we started APBF and there was a series, we did the box set and a number of the, the, the poets um, had written about the body, right? The body became a, a, a theme, right? And so you saw the body coming up and so on and so forth. 
Now, one of the great things about Nigerian writers, Nigerians in general, is the capacity to look at something and say, I'm going to work out how that works. I'm going to go to work it out to the beginning and then calculate it and then I'll get it perfected. That's, you know, this it's, it's, a, it's a kind of generalization. It's unfair and so on, but it's kind of true. So what began to happen is, Chris and I, Chris Abani and I wrote uh, in our essay talking about the body, how the body is dynamic and blah, blah, blah. So the next series of, of submissions from, from the poet, everybody had body in their poem, like body this and the body that and the body that. And I said, you see, and <laughs> most of them were the Nigerians saying, oh, you want body? I can give you body. <laughs> you, 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 want, you want music? I'll give you music. You, I can give you what you want. Um, so I just caution us to sort of write organically and don't take everything that we say is the cue for the new, the new topic, right? So anyway. Thank you, Kwame. I'm, I'm sure Nigerians would... Uh, <laughs> Greg, the body, the body's the body. <laughs> uh, just to, to add on to that, uh, I agree that the, the ways that we look at the body and the ways that we consider the body uh, in itself, just, just doing so can be uh, sort of revolutionary. And I'm immediately reminded of um, Yusef Komunyaka's poem, Anodyne. You know, uh, this, this uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna botch the, my, my memory of it. Um, it's old ragtime jubilee behind the left nipple, right? The, the, and so he, he's, he's celebrating his body, which we understand to be a black body, right? And he's celebrating it to the exclusion of the the ways that um, we are made to associate the black body with mutilation, with violence, and and, and suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was, and, and I, I can't say I understood you know, when I first encountered that poem, what was so moving to me about it, obviously the lyricism and all, and all that, but there was something really just unique about it. And I think that's, that's it. I'm just, I'm just uh, sort of figuring that out as I'm speaking, mm -hmm. is that we, you know, that we are, again, sort of um, encouraged to think about uh, the black body as a, as a locus of suffering, right? And then, but any other time that we, anything that we do otherwise, I think can be really powerful. And I, I would say quickly that one of the transformative power, the things that has shaped a lot of, of you know, black, black African diaspora work is women, women have, the black women writers have introduced that as a, as a nexus which has opened the space for its exploration, literally put their bodies in that place, whether it's Lucille Clifton, yeah. you know, whether it's Amata Edu, they literally sort of said, look at this body. And that has, that has been a liberation for even for, for black male writers and so on, because if you, if you trace it, that's one of the transformative articulations. You know, Zora Neale Hurston's book is, is, was, was really troubling to people because she was very conscious of a body in that sort of um, affirming way and, and the, the, the affront of the, 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 the woman's body um, as, it's, as, it, as, as it's been sort of really the black woman's body as it's been attacked and destroyed and, and, and abused um, historically. So I think there's, there's a lot of space for, for, for that articulation and, and I think we are seeing that increasingly um, in, 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 in how that helps us to to, to manage this diaspora conversation. Mm. Focus on the trans, the, the, that body as it makes it, as it converses, mm. it, it becomes incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful and enriching. Mm. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Kwame. We, we have so much questions coming in. So I'm gonna take a few summaries and, um, and then just uh, you know, call it a wrap. There's a question here I'm summarizing. In essence, it's saying, how do you engage with a violent Hakai, right? After all, black bodies are not the only people involved in making archives of black bodies. There are colonial archives, there are archives made, you know, from violent um, 
processes like the photographs and images and sound recordings. Um, Greg keeps working with slave narratives, some which were made by white anthropologists, right? And in sites of subjection, right? In conditions of force. And, you know, and, and, and Kwame is intimate with the history of uh, colonization from African diaspora, from the Caribbean and, and things like that. How do you engage, you know, with an archive that is essentially valid? So I'm um, back to this idea of, of translation. I was judging um, a prize a few years ago and I noticed <clears throat> one of the, the tropes that seemed to be recurring in a lot of the Black poets, uh, African-American poets' work was this roll call of the, the, the murdered Black men and women by, you know, folks murdered by uh, police violence, state violence. And, you know, while I, I understood it to be in, in earnest, it reading it over and over again, it became a, a trope. And I started thinking for my own work, how do I, how do I, I'm deeply interested in this conversation. I want to, I want to be in this, uh, uh, in the conversation, in the tradition. Uh, what is my unique way in? And so this is what got me thinking about um, the witchcraft and the demonization. Right, and so I, I'm. What I hope to do in some of the poems is to look at the the, the body as a site of um, not just as a site of violence, but um, as a, an object on onto which we project any number of, of political and politicized values. Thinking through the Inquisition, right, and thinking through uh, witch burning. And all of that being a, a way for me to talk about the, 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 the outrage and the absurdity of, uh, of lynching in the, in the U.S., for example, uh, of state-sponsored violence in the U.S., for example. Yeah. You, know, you know what's interesting? White, white supremacy and its archive, because white supremacy as a construct has been built on its exploitative nature of black bodies, native bodies, and other bodies, it's incapable in promoting and celebrating its history of triumph and success, is incapable of completely erasing the, the mechanisms and the tools of its success. Mm -hmm. This is one of the betrayals of archives, they have the way that an archive can betray you. What it's been capable of doing is silent is, is, is stopping access to those archives which contain the clues to that supremacy structure so so what what many of our great writers have done is found access to that archive and then reinterpret it so that is to read the archive by a different gaze a different positionality and then reconstructed it. So this is Kamal Brathwaite's work. This is what Merlene Obisa Phillips' Zong is about. It's about taking an actual narrative, a series of narratives based on the documented history of insurance policies mm -hmm. from, from during the, the, the mid-Atlantic slave trade and then extracting from that a narrative of African experience and African history that is different from the triumphant narrative of white supremacy and so on and so forth. So, 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 so as violent and as traumatic as entering into those archival spaces, that is, if you want to understand Jamaican slavery, you will not have immediate access yet, to some extent you do, but in a large extent, many of those details of the brutality of that slavery are contained in the accounts of the overseers, the white leaders. And, if, and when you go in there, you begin to start to trace and discover a whole world of history and narrative and so on. So I think one of the one of the great opportunities we have is is to to assault to to to, to and by that I mean sort of attack it, get into it, and and sort of examine um, those existing archives and those existing narratives to extract from them through a different kind of perspective 
what those archives actually mean and what they imply. And that is interpreter, interpretational, but it also has that, that element of, 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 of engaging it. Because it is, it is absolutely true that it is not the absence of information, but our failure to enter it or the intentional concealing of that information or making you know sort of making difficult access to that information that is part of built into the 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 the, 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 the construction of, of 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 white supremacy crudely put if you don't if you if you tell slaves they cannot read and write what are you doing well we're just multiplying that again and again we just keep repeating that system right mm. So I, so, I, so I think I think there's a lot that exists that is is begging to be sort of examined and challenged and explored, um, and I'm not saying that it's not difficult and painful, but it's necessary. Thank you, thank you, Kwame. Thank you, Greg. Three more questions. I'm going to summarize two as one, and then we're going to end on a note of wonder with the last question. So these two questions together, Kay and Panache are asking about Kwame specifically your project uh, wisteria right uh Kay is saying is it is it possible that there's a kind of intimacy a depth of intimacy only a stranger can access uh is, is there something distance does you know as an imaginative strategy panasha is asking about tenderness as a praxis of approach you know a young man is dealing with older women who haven't said things. And like you rightly said, dignified older women who have trafficked in silence for so long as a kind of grammar, right? How did you approach this? What role did tenderness play in that? And also strangeness, alienation. Okay, so I will answer more generally on the first part of that question, because the truth is the artist, the writer is, is both an intimate and a stranger in, in, in life and experience. I think once you once you add the gaze of sort of analyzing the reflecting on the world and writing it, you are both looking at it as an intimate, but you're also looking at it as a, you create an outsider status. Sometimes that is helped by actually being an outsider, right? Um, and and I think one of the things that is useful is to capitalize on 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 on, on that that ability but it's also an, a, a willful outsider status it's willful in the sense that you're using it to allow you to ask more questions and it, it, it is not a political position but a position of function a position of how you you generate your art the capacity to sort of pull yourself away from it any poet who is seriously editing their own work understands that that necessity if you if you if you don't have the ability to pretend this is not your work, you're going to struggle with editing your work, right? And that, that's just in crude practical terms, right? So I think that's I think that's a that's a factor. I think we should be very careful about sort of suggesting even that my encounter and conversation with those women was derived from one linear notion that I was an outsider coming inside. That 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 would be unfair because. There were many ways in which I was an insider, sort of dealing with them as outsiders coming into that space too. So there's also that thing. And then also we were both insiders because I was black and, and they understood me to be black in that space. And then I was a deeper insider because they were older than me and I was treating them as elders. And that relationship is also an existing insider relationship or, or who, it, or at least in terms of the power structure that is in operation. So I think it's always more complicated than that. Um, I think we use the different levels of status, both on their part and on my part, to navigate difficult subjects, right? Um, and and I, think, I think I had to get permission after the fact to use their work. I, did, I wasn't planning to use it to write anything. After the fact, I did get permission. So they didn't come into it thinking, this man is writing poems about us, because I wasn't. I came just to interview them. So that creates another kind of dynamic. When I did write the poems, were they really about them in that sort of strict way? Not necessarily, but I got their permission to, to talk about and to show them the work, to see, you know, to see how they would respond to it. So it's relational and it's more complex than, than just something that you can do sort of automatically, right? Um, 
and every every situation is different. Every situation that I've been involved in has been has been profoundly different um, in, in in the way that that operates. The idea of tenderness to me is, I think I th I want to think that there was tenderness uh, on my part, uh, but but I I think the more overwhelming sort of construction of that dynamic relationship has to do with how I'm brought up. I, I'm talking to women who are, who are older women. They are my elders. I, I, I cannot approach them with anything else but a certain kind of recognition that they carry in them the authority that is automatic. That, that's how I'm raised, right? I, I don't know, you know, not everybody's raised that way, but that's how I'm raised. So therefore that, so, so maybe it is that part of the relationship that, that helped generate that thing. But also they brought a certain kind of thing, like humor. Some of them brought humor. Some of them were being intentionally provocative to make me uncomfortable. The, so don't, don't, don't get it twisted. It wasn't me sort of like, I'm the authority here having a really, no, no, no. Some of them intentionally told me really provocative things. And they looked at me squirming in my pants and laughed at me and said, hey, don't worry, I'll tell you about so, so it's all more, it's more dynamic than any kind of straightforward, mm -hmm. uh, straightforward. It's relational as all things tend to be. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. The last question, and I'm paraphrasing wildly here. Uh, Derek Walker speaks about the faith of poetry being to fall in love with the world in spite of history. In both of your works, you know, despite the difficult subjects you grapple with, you also grapple with joy and resistance in an unbelievable way. Parent-child dynamics, the joy of the body, the joy of resistance and tenderness, right? To fall in love with the world in spite of history. How is this central to your world, Greg? How is this central to your world, honey? Well, I go to immediately to the, the complex relationship I have have had with my father. And um, and that's kind of paradigmatic for the way I think about my relationship to, you know, to racism, to white supremacy, to patriarchy, to these larger discourses of, of oppression, real and discursive. Um, and I, I don't want to fall into a sort of unilateral or, or, or one story kind of relationship with these structures, right? Because I, I, I live within these structures and, I, and I, I, I want to, if I'm only telling one facet of it, if I'm only looking at it from, from one facet, then I'm, I'm excluding, you know, all kinds of possibilities, artistic and, and intellectual and emotional possibilities so what is it to what does it mean to love a difficult father right what is it what does it mean to feel um, proud of a, a community that is you know whether there's violence on the on the sidewalk you know uh, any moment of the of the day um, to, to love a community in which the the Police are, are overseers and, and you know very uh, oppressive presence. So it's not you know I, I go back to what Kwame was saying about not sort of falling into these these kind of simplified uh, or, or um, codified ways of thinking about our environment. I, I don't want to I don't want to fall into a discourse of joy only. And I don't want to fall into a, a, a discourse of, of suffering and, and um, uh, or, or, or even Baldwin's, you know, cr criticism of the protest, no, the protest, protest literature, right? And, and uh, but I, I do want to find ways to make use of, of all of this energy, um, and hopefully, you know, this is my, where my faith comes in, my ethos of wanting a world that is um, where our, all of our imaginations are free to, to flourish, hopefully that mere ethos will come through in, in some way in the, in the poems, that I don't have to try and um, 
you know, and articulate it in, mm. in a programmatic way. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Kwame. <sighs> you know, I, I, I don't put any kind of pressure on poetry except to articulate experience and to do that with integrity and truth. And mm. That's it. I mean, um, if, if joy emerges, okay. <laughs> but but if not, okay. Um, I, I yeah I I I, I um, yeah that's I, I know people want I, and I know a lot I get a lot of like you know Kwame I heard you read and you know I was so shocked because your poems are so angry but you are such a happy guy like you're a really fun guy and I go well what do you want me to say like. <laughs> You know, I don't know. Maybe I had a good meal earlier. <laughs> Happy about that. It ain't got to have to do with anything with poetry. So <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, 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 you know, I, 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 and Derek, Derek's thing is nice and so on. But you know, Derek Walcott's statement is cute. But I, I don't know if, if I, I don't know if joy sort of emanates from Derek Walcott's poetry. <laughs> like it is not. Like. It's beauty, it's truth, and delight in, see, I like delight in the way that delight means we are enervated, sort of, sort of given, a, enlivened by that engagement, right? And that engagement can come through horror. It can come through beauty. It can come through all the different dimensions. And, and, and I, I, I get that part, but the quest for joy is, um, is an indulgence that I, I, I can't, I, I will seek elsewhere and not necessarily in me writing poems. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll get joy out of making a good poem. Um, or if I get a lot of money for a poem, I might have a great deal of joy. You know? And that joy, and that poem could really be about like really mean stuff. So what, what, what am I going to do? Like, you know, what, what is there to do? But don't worry, guys. I'm a very happy guy. Look at me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kwame and Gregory. Oh, what a beautiful evening. It's been full of light. You know, it's been full of it's been full of great cadence and just really revelatory things. I'm happy. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. This is a series. So next up, we're going to continue with Safia Eilo and Ladan Usman. You'll find the details on our website, on our Instagram and, and Twitter, etc. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. This is the flagship program of A Long House. You know, blackness, true hearts and aesthetics and language as a form of long memory. Uh, conversations across intimate diasporas. Thank you. Uh, this is great. This is this one is for the history archive. <laughs>